name is Carson McPherson Kretzky. I'm a PhD student in the geoscience department and the co-founder and community engagement coordinator for the Hazard and Climate Resilience Institute. Uh, and we're excited that you guys are here. This is our third session in community engagement events. Uh, and these are just learning sessions. We want to hear more from our community about the projects that people are working on and how the HCRI members can be involved and just have a better understanding of what's happening in the Treasure Valley. So that's the point of these sessions. Um, next session, today we have Jay Breidenbach, but next session I just want to plug really quick. It's going to be on November 12th uh, and we'll have Alexis Pickering from the Western Idaho Community Health Collaboration and she will be talking about addressing the social determinants of health through cross-sector collaboration. So put that on your calendar, November 12th, 11 to noon. Uh, mountain time. Um, but yeah, so today we are really excited to have Jay here. Um, he, we, before we start, I wanted to do this last time. If in the chat, if you wouldn't mind just putting um, your position in which organization you come from and maybe also your favorite season since today we're talking about weather. So go ahead and do that first because I think it's kind of fun to see who we have in the room here. I'll do mine first. Yeah, fall's great. So position, where your what your organization is, and favorite season. Nice. And you can go ahead and just keep keep adding those so we can kind of get a sense of who's here. All right, so um, Jay, just to introduce Jay, Jay is the Warning Coordination uh, Meteorologist for the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Boise, Idaho. He's responsible for managing coordination, decision support, and outreach from the National Weather Service with emergency management partners in southwestern Idaho and southwestern Oregon. Jay has over 25 years of experience with the National Weather Service, which includes work in the National Weather Service Research and Development Laboratories in Silver Springs, Maryland, where he developed severe weather al algorithms and flood forecasting techniques. Jay moved to Idaho in 2001 to work at the Boise Weather Forecast Office and served as senior hydrologist from 2001 to 2011. Jay has been Forecast Office's Warning Coordination Meteorologist since 2011. And he has a master's degree in meteorology from Florida State University. When he's not telling everybody about the weather, he enjoys the great outdoors in his spare time and skiing, hiking, and photography. And today he's going to talk about uh, the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program and also give us some seasonal forecasts and tell us a little bit about whatever else he's working on. So I will now turn it over to Jay and you can go ahead and start screen sharing when you want. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Carson. Thank you, uh, Brittany. It's, it's just been an unbelievable uh, privilege to work with uh, HCRI, uh, especially this summer. Um, you see uh, John uh, Bumgarner is on the call uh, today as well. Uh, he was an important part of our partnership with HCRI as well this summer. Uh, John joined us in, in May. He is uh, currently uh, just about to finish up his degree at Ohio State University. Uh, so some of the work you'll see here today is, is John's work, and um, uh, he's been working uh, really closely with us to build a Weather Ready Nation in partnership with HCRI to serve uh, the Treasure Valley in Idaho and actually uh, a larger area. So um, just wanted to kind of start with that, and um, I'll keep talking here. I'm going to try to share my screen so you can see my, my presentation here here. All right. Can everybody see that? I think if I go, yep. okay, great. Looks good. Um, so this uh, Zoom technology is absolutely amazing here to come together. And uh, a little bit later on, we're going to try a, a brand new experimental Zoom um, feature that I just found out about. We'll try that later. So stay tuned uh, for that. But um, I tell you what, we're living, living in the future. Um, as uh, Carson uh, mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, what it means to build a weather ready nation in Idaho. And that's all in the context of the 
really extreme weather, water, and climatic events that have been occurring uh, more frequently uh, across the entire United States. So I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about that, some of the trends uh, that we're seeing with extreme uh, weather events in the United States and in Idaho, um, and what our response in NOAA National Weather Service uh, is uh, to that. And actually, I'm going to put this in presentation mode. So you may know a little bit about uh, the National Weather Service. Our office in, in Boise is located out on the campus of the National Interagency Fire Center. Obviously, weather plays an important role in uh, wildfire, how wildfires behave and move. And uh, knowing something about the weather is, is really important if you're, you're uh, uh, managing a wildfire uh, that, that keeps everybody uh, safe. We're one of 122 uh, forecast offices around the country. There's only two that serve Idaho. Our office, well, actually there's four that serve Idaho. Our office in Boise, we have another one in Pocatello. And then we have an office in Spokane that serves the Panhandle region. And one in Missoula, Montana that serves um, the um, kind of the central portion of the state, Idaho County. Like, you know, to Eastern Oregon uh, with forecast and we're the state liaison office. So we, we do a lot of work with uh, state emergency management. Um, and Esther in Idaho, we're going to be uh, giving uh, weather briefings out at the uh, emergency operations center out at Gallon, Gallon Field. Um, so that's just a little bit about what we do. We've got quite a bit of technology. I think you'll see that. Um, in the presentation here, uh, there you see a picture of our, our radar. Uh, that's a Doppler radar. That's one of our big tools that, that we use uh, to look at uh, severe thunderstorms. And we've been busy upgrading that technology and, and working with our partners across the country uh, to build resilience to weather. That's, in a nutshell, what, what our mission is all about. Actually, that's our vision, to build a weather-ready nation. And uh, that supports our mission uh, to protect lives and property from uh, adverse weather uh, conditions and enhance the national economy. Um, I think a lot of people forget about that part of our mission, but when you see the amount of economic damage that happens because of um, these extreme weather events and the changing climate, uh, that's, that's a big issue. So uh, I thought that it would be interesting to start with the current weather situation. Uh, this is uh, current satellite imagery. I pulled it off and put it here in the presentation uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, and right away, you'll see Hurricane Delta in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is gonna be another major hurricane that's gonna um, strike the United States tomorrow. Uh, along the northern Gulf Coast, uh, somewhere uh, near the Texas-Louisiana border. And if you remember, we had a major hurricane earlier this year hit the same region. Hurricane Laura caused billions of dollars of damage in the Lake Charles, uh, Louisiana area. Catastrophic hurricane. Uh, it looks like maybe another repeat somewhere in the same uh, vicinity. This is uh, looking down from our uh, geostationary uh, satellite goes east. And uh, this is our true color uh, visible uh, imagery. So you can see a lot of detail on this, and including uh, um, the eye of the storm, a uh, very small, intense uh, eye uh, associated with Hurricane Delta. Interestingly, the Hurricane Center, we used up the entire uh, alphabet. And uh, now we're into the Greek alphabet. Um, so uh, Hurricane uh, Delta for you. And as you look at what's happened in 2020 so far, we've already had 16 weather and climate related disasters that have exceeded $1 billion. And, and some of these are multi-billion dollar uh, disasters, starting with all of the wildfires. Those are actually weather events because you think of all the lightning activity that we had, that was, on top of very dry conditions um, from this uh, multi-year western drought and heat wave. We had extreme heat, as you know, um, 
over much of the West at, at times this summer, including uh, the hottest temperature, um, maybe ever recorded 130 degrees in Death Valley this year. Lots of severe weather here in the central and eastern United States at three separate tornado outbreaks exceeding a billion dollars. And then this unbelievable uh, derecho event, which occurred on August 10th. And uh, it was basically like an inland hurricane, uh, 100 mile an hour winds over a large section of uh, Iowa. And then we've already had three major hurricanes. There's Hurricane Laura, and I think, unfortunately, we're going to add a fourth hurricane to this map. And this is all part of a, a national trend that we've seen. Uh, these are all of the different uh, billion dollar disasters uh, dating back to 1980. And uh, these are um, adjusted by the consumer uh, uh, price index or CPI adjusted. So, you know, we're basically comparing apples to apples here. And so already in 2020, $450 billion worth, worth of, of damage. And so you see this, this increase. Uh, looks like 1987 was the only year that we didn't have a, um, a billion dollar weather disaster. And they're broken up by different types of weather and climate events. Um, floods, are, they're causing a lot of damage uh, as well. And of course, tropical cyclones certainly get um, a, a lot of the news when, when they happen. So um, anyway, this is just a, an increasing trend. We don't see it, it happen or, or changing anytime soon because the number of vulnerable com communities um, is increasing. There's, there's more uh, development in areas that are at risk, especially along the coast, along rivers. Um, and in the changing climate, we're, we're seeing uh, more, more severe weather um, as well. Um, just to kind of highlight some of the, the previous events, uh, Hurricane Michael, I like to talk about Hurricane Michael a lot. This was our most recent uh, Category 5 catastrophic hurricane uh, in 2018, in October of 2018, uh, destroyed Panama City, Tyndall Air Force Base, and and there's some of the destructions. I, I got a chance to walk on this beach um, last February, and it looked still pretty much like it does in, in this picture, pretty much wiped off the map. Um, and the, the wind damage extended uh, well inland, uh, basically leveled forest, um, destroyed large buildings in, in Panama City, well away from, from the water. So. This was just a, a catastrophic um, hurricane, uh, but remarkably only, um, well, less than 20 people lost their lives in that storm. And you compare it to a similar storm that happened on September 8, 1900. Um, this was the, the, Gal the great Galveston hurricane of 1900. Um, 10,000 lives were lost. And you see some of the headlines uh, from that storm uh, that occurred in, in 1900. It probably was a, a category four hurricane. And um, you see some of the, the, the destruction there. 10,000 lives, why the difference? Hurricane Michael was probably a stronger hurricane than the Galveston hurricane. Why, did, why do you think we have such a difference? Well, some of you are probably thinking, well, the forecasts were better, and, and that is true. Uh, computer models provided accurate forecasts several days before the storm arrived. In fact, um, the Hurricane Center took an unprecedented step of it initiating um, advisories on this storm even before it had a closed circulation uh, because the models were showing uh, the, the, this portion of uh, Florida near Panama City was the most likely place for a, a hurricane to happen. So absolutely, uh, the forecasts were better. Again, that's a, a use of our, our technology to um, help with, with better forecasts. But if you remember, we had our last um, 
horrible hurricane uh, before this that claimed over a thousand lives was uh, uh, Hurricane Maria. Before that, Hurricane Katrina um, did terrible destruction in the New Orleans area. And we always do service assessments, try to learn from that. And it was starting to become clear when Hurricane Katrina, uh, which wasn't even as strong as Hurricane Michael, uh, hit New Orleans that we needed to start working with people a little bit more so that they could understand their risk so that so that they would have a plan uh, when a hurricane happened. So, you know, it, it really goes beyond an accurate forecast and we're starting to realize that when um, Katrina happened. So I think we've learned some lessons. People are starting to learn that there's another event that I'll be talking about here in just a minute that it really hammered it home and it, it really kind of changed the way we do business in the National Weather Service from, you know, just issuing forecasts to actually developing partnerships and um, um, focusing on, on education and, and the social science of what it takes to um, spur people into action to, to protect their, their um, lives and property. So there you see a satellite montage of, of what uh, Hurricane Michael did forming down there in the uh, Caribbean Sea and then moving up um, right on forecast with those, those models. Of course, we've been dealing with drought. These are current drought conditions and this has become a really persistent issue in recent years in the Western United States. It's very rare to, to look at the U.S. drought monitor and not see some uh, severe to extreme drought conditions somewhere in the Western United States. And, and that's no different this year. And of course that sets the stage for extreme wildfires. And if you look back at the Western wildfires in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, We've had over 200 fatalities from these wildfires, over $100 billion worth of, of damage. So this is clearly an area where we need to do more work, more preparation. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of what HCRI is doing with um, some of the um, short courses and workshops on wildfire preparedness, uh, because this trend is simply not gonna stop. Uh, we're gonna have more and more of this and and weather drought is gonna to continue to play a, a role in these wildfires. And the destruction is just catastrophic. This is Paradise, California, but you saw some of the same types of pictures from the uh, wildfires in our neighboring state in Oregon uh, this year. I'm telling you, the same type of thing can happen here in, in Idaho. It could happen here, um, in southwestern Idaho, there's a lot of urban wildland interface. We have to be prepared for this. Um, so, so that's certainly uh, another uh, weather related issue. And then related to that, the historic wildfire smoke uh, that we've been having in recent years. This wildfire smoke from the fires in the West actually circumnavigated the entire Northern hemisphere. Uh, this year, you could trace it in satellite imagery all the way around um, the globe. So it's it's really a historic event. And of course, we were right in the chimney here in Boise at times. Our, our air quality was terrible. And of course, that's a human health hazard as well. Those uh, small smoke particles lodge deep in your lungs and it's super, super hazardous. Um, so again, that's uh, looking uh, down at the smoke. Uh, earlier this year from the August complex, one of the biggest wildfires in the history of California. And we got all of the smoke here in, in, in Idaho. Um, it's not just limited to hurricanes and wildfires, but that winter of 2017 was amazing. Um, it didn't quite have a $100 billion disaster in Idaho, but hey, we were on, on our way to it. And you look around the West, you might remember the Oregon or the Oroville uh, Dam spillway, spillway failure in 2017. Um, it's just something that can happen with extreme weather. In the same year, we worked really closely with um, 
Idaho Office of Emergency Management to, to give uh, daily um, daily uh, briefings on um, the situation across the state. And so uh, these are some of the executive weather summaries. And this one's kind of interesting, the extreme snow load that came in this big atmospheric river and monster storm off the coast and built an unbelievable snowpack and caused um, pretty devastating flooding in, in southern Idaho. And then we had the historic snow melt in central Idaho, 100 days above flooding on uh, the Boise River. So um, I think the totals were about $100 million worth of damage um, in Idaho when you tally up all of that uh, that occurred in, in 2017. Um, obviously, it could get much worse. Um, we've simulated what a hundred year, I mean, a 500 year flood might look like in uh, Boise, um, in the project with the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, Ada County Emergency Management. Uh, that's probably our billion dollar event if, if that um, happens. And it probably will sometime in the next 500 years. Um, we'll have a, a major flood here in, in Boise, in an area where population is growing, so we're, again, exposing more and more population to uh, potential risk. So we, we certainly have to be uh, weather ready, flood ready, climate ready, wildfire ready, right here in Idaho. So, so again, partnering with HCI uh, to build the weather ready nation right here in Idaho is, is uh, really important. Obviously, that depends on technology. I talked about the radar, the satellite, uh, the modeling. I mean, we run computer models with millions of lines of code on, on supercomputers at NOAA. And so um, uh, certainly it depends on our technology that feeds into accurate forecasts. It depends on being able to communicate that you know, with, with warnings. So you, know, you may have received a wireless emergency alert on your cell phone. That's part of working with FEMA and the uh, Federal Communications Commission to upgrade notifications ahead of uh, uh, high risk situations. But that fourth point, it depends on people. That's what we're talking about when it comes to uh, building a, a weather ready nation. It, it depends on um, working with people because ultimately we're just people and some of us have different risk, risk perceptions. Um, and so I, I think, you know, educating uh, people in, in a way that they can trust that education. Sometimes they don't trust the federal government, right? National Weather Service is part of NOAA, which is part of the Department of Commerce, Commerce which is part of the federal government. There are parts of our community that may not trust the federal government. So being able to, to develop partners like HCRI um, to work through our counties and our county emergency managers in our cities and our city emergency managers um, to get our message through a trusted source. That's what we're learning is becoming a, a more important thing. It's all about trust. And um, so if you can trust the message, if you can trust the information on uh, preparedness, you know, no matter what the hazard is, that helps people be prepared. If, if, if we can share preparedness information and it will make a difference and it will save lives and it will uh, protect property. And so that, that brings me to a story. Where did this Weather Ready Nation initiative Come from. We talked about Hurricane Katrina. Well, there was a super outbreak of tornadoes in in uh, 2011, um, and that ended up being a pivotal pivotal moment for the National Weather Service or pivotal event because, um, well, you may know that tornadoes generally have a pretty short. Morning, and the news would say, Oh, the storm hit without warning. Well, with all of our increasing technology, that's pretty rare to have a tornado hit without warning. There is some lead time. Typically, we're averaging 15, 20 minutes, you know, before the storm comes. That doesn't sound like a lot, but 
for a tornado, a super short-lived event. That's pretty impressive lead time. And in 2011, some of these tornadoes had over 30 minute lead time before they approached a given location. And so we were going, you know, right after the event, wow, can you believe the job we did with National Weather Service with, with the lead time kind of patting our backs. And then when we actually did the service assessment on that, well, the news wasn't so good. We didn't do such a good job because uh, unfortunately, a lot of people lost their lives and, and well, well, why was it? Well, it turns out that a good warning, a good lead time on that morning really wasn't good enough. Because um, what our social scientists were telling us is that um, people really didn't understand the risk. They had been in tornado warnings before and nothing happened. So, I mean, maybe that's, you know, an issue with that, uh, you know, kind of fine tuning the area we warn so that, you know, there aren't false alarms, but, you know, the fact that you're in a tornado warning, you know, you're going to be sheltering maybe for 15, 30 minutes, you know, so this risk perception, there, there was kind of a fundamental, you know, misunderstanding. So, in, in the um, service assessment, the recommendation as well, we needed to do a better job with, with education and we needed to work through our partners to, to do it. And so that's where this idea of, okay, we really need to build a weather ready nation. It goes beyond just issuing, you know, watches, warnings and advisories and thinking that's, that's our job. It goes way beyond that. And so, uh, that's that became our vision to build a weather ready nation and we launched this uh, weather ready nation ambassador program and and historically our emergency managers have been ambassadors for um, the communities that they serve you know this idea that um, if we could supply an emergency manager with accurate forecast and they could distribute that information uh, to their network and um, all of the people they work with in, in their counties and communities that that, that would help. And it, it does help. And um, it certainly helps with, with preparedness and emergency action plans. And the Weather Service has lots of preparedness information. So then we thought nationally, we thought, well, what if other agencies and organizations could be ambassadors for us as well. So that's that's where this Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program uh, came about. And here's a little brochure that, that talks just a little bit more about it. And uh, <clears throat> if you go to this website, weather.gov slash WRN Ambassadors, uh, you'll see that brochure, some success stories. And if you're not already, uh, a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, you can uh, click on this little button here to apply. And so, if, if for example, if if you're a faith-based organization, John Bumgarner likes to talk about that, the people in that faith um, community probably trust their pastor more than they trust, you know, the, the National Weather Service. Um, Maybe it's the Red Cross. Actually, the Red Cross at a national level is a Weather Ready Nation ambassador for us as well. So these are kind of examples of, of Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. Um, so anyway, if, if you're a leader in an organization um, that serves people, uh, you have an opportunity here to, to apply. Uh, it's a quick sign up, takes about five minutes, and we'll work with you to, to help get you more uh, prepared in this information. But I can't tell you how much of an honor it has been for John and I to work with HCRI, Hazard and Climate Resilience Institute at Boise State, on, on exactly this. And so uh, this is their webpage. Um, and you see some of the tabs, some of the parts of the uh, uh, website that. Um, John has been partnering with to, to get a little more information on flooding, extreme winter weather, heat. And we had some extreme heat this summer, extreme summer weather that includes uh, microburst activity, drought, wildfire, and, and smoke. Um, so 
I would encourage you to look at some of these tabs. Um, part of being an excellent Weather Ready Nation ambassador is, is being able to share information about various types of, of weather, climate, and flood hazards. And that's exactly what HCRI is uh, doing. And, and so if you go to their page and go to this local resources and hazards tab, there's information that you can use right there with your community locally. You can share this information. Um, some of it came from the Weather Service, some of it came right, right from HCRI in, in their hard work. Um, so uh, it's just a fabulous, fabulous resource that I think, you know, can serve the Treasure Valley, can serve Idaho and the broader community as, as HCRI uh, grows um, at, at Boise State University, you know, even beyond serving uh, our region here. So. I would just encourage you to look at that. And this is something that, I mean, you don't have to do this if you become a Weather Ready Nation ambassador. Maybe it's just sharing um, social media that talks about preparation for different types of, of hazards. That would be a great thing for any, any Weather uh, Ready Nation ambassador uh, to do. But anyway, I'm just really, really excited about the work that HCRI has done and is uh, making available on their page. And you drill down to these, on these pages, they all kind of follow a similar uh, format. And so and I think they're unbelievably timely for this time, for this year. And, and you see, well, the one on the top there about air quality and smoke. First thing you'll get is an overview of what the hazard is all about, how to prepare, and then some local resources. Some of those are weather service resources. Some of them are resources that HCRI has, has developed and some of them come from, from other agencies, but they're all organized here so that you can use them. And then of course, you know, we wanna look at, well, what is the worst case scenario and, and how is a change in climate likely to impact that? In most cases, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's gonna make it worse. So we, we just have to really be uh, prepared. So. Anyway, that's a, a really, really exciting thing that, that HCRI has been uh, working on. Another thing that, that John Bumgarner uh, did this year, a lot of the national resources that you'll get uh, from our headquarters office in, in Silver Spring are gonna focus on national hazards. So they might have something on tsunami preparedness. They might have something on hurricane preparedness. Well, that's important stuff, not exactly relevant to Idaho, um, and so what John has done is develop a lot of resources. Some of those are shared on the HCRI page, but um, he prepared these um, ambassador notes. So there was one on excessive heat. There was one on air quality. There was one on, on wildfire that went out to our local Weather Ready Nation ambassadors in Oregon and Idaho. And they could share that with their, their kind of email list, their partners. And so that's, I think, another really cool thing that we've done. And we've got a lot of great ideas on how to make these really effective. Not, not a lot to look at, but just kind of a one or two pager uh, fact sheet and preparation sheet that could be shared. Um, so that's a really cool thing um, as well. And, you know, it could just be just some simple tips for heat safety. You don't typically think of heat being that much of a hazard, but it is nationwide, you know, heat waves claim a lot of people. So which, which brings me back to HCRI. I'll have a few more slides here, but I am really excited to announce that um, the Hazard and um, Climate Resilience Institute was recognized nationally by, the, by NOAA National Weather Service as a Weather Ready Nation Ambassador of Excellence. So if you go out to our national page and you, you look around to the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador tab, you'll, you'll see this wonderful picture of uh, the people at HCRI. And, and remember, it's always about people that are making this difference on the NOAA, the NOAA website. So I just wanted to congratulate HCRI uh, for, for that excellent work and for receiving this, this national uh, recognition. Um, what I'm going to do here at this point, I'm going to break out of my presentation. I'm going to come back. I promise I'll come back 
and we'll have some time for questions. And I wanted to give you a quick peek at the current weather situation, the current forecast, and a, um, a look into the future, what winter might look like. But I wanted to follow up on this recognition, and I have um, a presentation to make here. So let's see. I think if I stop sharing my screen. All right, I'm starting to get the hang of uh, this uh, Zoom. And what I have here for this special presentation, I have a plaque here for HCRI. This comes with the uh, recognition as a Weather Ready Nation Ambassador of Excellence. And I'd like to just read this here. And then, uh, Brittany, if I could have you come forward, I'll, I'll, I'm, I want to do a presentation using that new uh, Zoom technology that I was talking about. So let me read this first. First, let me show you this, this plaque here. You can see that. It's really, uh, um, it really says, Weather Ready Nation Ambassador of Excellence, Hazard and Climate Resilience Institute, and it's signed by Mike Canton, meteorologist in charge, October 1st, 2020. And the citation reads, the National Weather Service recognizes the Hazard and Climate Resilience Institute as a Weather Ready Nation ambassador of excellence for their exceptional contributions in building resilience to weather, water, and climate hazards in Southwestern Idaho and Southeastern Oregon. HCRI, a distinguished research institution at Boise State University, promotes community resilience through their educational workshops, web pages, and whole community collaboration to proactively build resilience to hazards and the impacts of a changing climate. So congratulations, congratulations. Brittany, if I could have you come forward and let, let me click on this, this new experimental feature on Zoom, click. All right, and I'm going to pass this through the screen here. Okay. Oh, Jay, that's really nice. Thank you. It's a beautiful plaque. I think we will definitely hang this in our department. And, um, you know, it's a real honor to, to work with you. So thanks. It's beautiful. Yeah. You can unmute your phones and round of applause. It works. That new technology. Yeah, it's amazing. I can't believe that you could actually transfer things through Zoom like that. That's pretty neat. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Yes. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the nomination and, and for the honor. It's a pleasure to work with you. Okay, I'm going to come back to my presentation here, and, and I wanted to have some time for questions. Let me go back over here. Okay, are you seeing my screen again, everybody? Okay. Yep. All right. So, um, be thinking of some questions here, because I, I wanted to have some open discussion about this. Um, and while you're thinking of those questions, and I, I like a nice interactive discussion, so I hope we get some good questions here. Um, Brittany asked me to uh, say just a little bit about the current forecast. And we've been looking at our, our um, numerical weather prediction models and we see one of those um, working at the bottom. I, I thought it went just a little bit further in time, but anyway, it shows this cold front moving through this weekend. So uh, we're still gonna have some smoke from the California wildfires here today and tomorrow. Uh, but then that cold front is going to come through on Saturday afternoon and hopefully bring some beneficial rain to Idaho. And, and um, we're really hoping that ends the wildfire season here in Idaho. And by Sunday, uh, much um, colder weather moves into the area, only a, high of, only a high of 57 on Sunday. And uh, that cool weather will linger into the first part of next week. And then we should kind of warm back up a little bit. Um, the big question though is what this winter may look like. And this is the very latest sea surface temperature anomalies over the Pacific Ocean. And what I wanted to show you is here along the equator out towards the international date line, this area of, of cold temperature anomalies. Um, 
believe me, the water is still warm. If you go out here in the tropical Pacific, it would be nice to go to a nice tropical island, but it's colder than it normally is out there. And it's so cold, at least in terms of the anomaly, that um, La Nina conditions have developed in the Pacific Ocean. And they're likely to, persist, to persist through the Northern Hemisphere winter, probably into the spring. And what that does is that shifts the position of the jet stream. Typically, we get a very active jet stream that um, comes into the Pacific Northwest and the, the Northern United States. Um, and that changes the climatology for the season, at least the seasonal climatology. So the Pacific Northwest is likely to be wetter than normal. Our, our most uh, recent La Nina was in 2017, and I, I showed you that big snowpack that we had in 2017. That doesn't guarantee we're going to have an extreme weather, but it, or extreme winter, but it tilts the odds just a little bit. So, um, Carson mentioned I like to ski. I'm pretty excited when we have an, an El, or La Nina winter because uh, usually that means it's going to be a pretty good season. And, and that's uh, reflected in the winter outlook from our climate prediction center. You see, uh, in terms of precipitation, higher probabilities of above normal precipitation and uh, below normal temperatures across the northern United States. The Boise area is kind of on the edge of that, only small shift in probability in, in that area. Um, but I, I, I still kind of like the odds, you know, at least the odds of falling in above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation is, is uh, smaller than it has been in um, recent years. So uh, that's our official outlook for um, the uh, upcoming winter. Sneak peek, sneak peek. Thank so you, with, Jay. You're, you're welcome. So with that, I, I think we have some time for questions, right? Yep, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, so Jay, maybe it's kind of nice to see people. So if you want to stop sharing your screen and then for those participants who feel comfortable sharing their video, it would be great to see you. If not, that's totally fine too. Um, yeah, so we have the next 15 minutes. Um, I thought it also might be kind of fun to just ask the audience where you guys typically get your weather information from, whether it's social media, Um, maybe just kind of fun to hear from everyone where they typically get their weather information. Um, so I was just going to start it off with a question and then I'll open it up to the, um, the audience if they have anything. Um, I guess I was just curious kind of in the next five year time frame, um, what do you hope to see in the Treasure Valley in terms of like building the ambassador program or connections that you've made or just what do you hope um, the next five years produces in an ideal situation? That's a, that's a great um, question, uh, Carson. You know, and I think carrying the momentum that we're, we're, we have right now with, with HCRI for the next uh, five years, uh, I, I would love to see that happen. You know, you look at the vision that HCRI has of, of building resilience in uh, the community, that's going to involve other people, other, other organizations. So I, you know, I would hope that in the next five years, we have a lot more preparedness information that we can share with the community about um, hazards right here in, in the Treasure Valley. The population in the Treasure Valley, is, we know that's gonna continue to grow. So uh, we'll certainly have new audience members to, uh, to share that information with, but you know, I, I really hope that we'll have additional with the Ready Nation ambassadors in, in the next uh, five years. You know, if you look at, um, you know, uh, well, we have, for example, Ada County Emergency Management, HCRI. You know, it would be awesome if we had, as John would like to say, some, some faith based um, organizations in the Treasure Valley be willing to kind of share some of this, this information. So yeah, I, I'd like to see that happen over the next uh, five years as, as well. Um, but most importantly, I, I hope in five years with this in, increasing population that we truly have a resilient community. And the next time the Boise River floods that 
you know, we people are safe. That's 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 the real goal. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, and I think for for anyone in the in the audience, I think the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program, you can be like the time commitment can vary. So for us, we've done a lot and we've worked worked a lot with with the, our partners here, but but you could also just forward an email, you know, it's simple. And so if you are part of organizations or groups um, where you have a, that kind of capacity, that's fine too. So I just wanna mention that. Um, all right, does anyone from the audience wanna ask Jay some questions? He has so much knowledge. So, okay, Moji, you can go ahead. Hi, Jay, first of all, congrats at CRI. Amazing job, I'm really happy to see you're recognized for this and thanks Jay for the uh, for the nomination. My question is rather subjective. You know, I, you know, I, I wonder what is the relative or do, how do you see the soft infrastructure versus the hard infrastructure in a weather in, in a nation or a weather ready nation? I mean, what where do you see we are going or where do you see we should go? So we soft structure you mean people and hard structure you mean technology yeah yes well i think we're going to see more and more focus on that soft structure because uh, i don't think we're going to be getting any new satellites or radar technology certainly within the next what, five years um so it, it, it's really about focusing on um Kind of that soft structure and working with people and and kind of bringing in social science to this so you know the the weather service is always kind of focused on hard science right we do research um at a basic level the universities are really excellent at you know hard science questions um modeling i mean there's still a lot there, let me take that back. There's still going to be some hard science uh, as well uh, that needs to be done. Um, and so an example there might be um, running more ensembles of models to kind of have a better understanding of the true range of probabilities around different extreme weather events. For example, on, on the hurricane that's going to hit the United States tomorrow, you run hundreds and hundreds of model simulations of this, you can see where the most likely point of landfall is, but you have some probability around, you know, either side of, 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 of that. And so, but then that starts to get into the soft science part of that. How do you communicate that kind of probability distribution to the people that are on the site that may not be at risk, but still could be how much risk are they, they willing to take and so I, I think that's where it starts to get into social science and trying to help scientists that the weather service is full of understand how to communicate better and to communicate that message to the people so that they understand it uh, better so I, I think that but that's a lot of what Weather Ready Nation is about. It's about that soft part of communication and just understanding how, how real people perceive information, behave, and act upon it. Thank you. Yeah, great, great answer, Jay. All right, so what else do people want to hear from Jay? And it can be current weather too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can go ahead and ask a question while we're while we're thinking of some some more. Um, so, let's see. Can you talk a little bit about the your relationship with the Silver? I just think the Silver Jackets is a really cool program, and I don't know if everybody knows about it. And hopefully, we'll actually have a presentation related to that in a little while. But um, but yeah, can you just talk a little bit about who the Silver Jackets are and what you guys are working on? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Actually, I see uh, Troy Lindquist is doing the, uh, the conversation here uh, as well. He's our senior hydrologist uh, in, in our office. And um, so um, 
he will be a great person, I think, to maybe speak about the Silver Jackets. I'll, I'll just kind of briefly summarize so the Silver Jackets um, is, and by the way, we, they're not like actual Silver Jackets. I keep asking, where's my Silver Jacket? That would be really cool to have. But the Silver Jackets, um, they have my NOAA logo on. The Army Corps of Engineers has a logo. FEMA has a logo. They, you know, all of these, you know, the state has a logo. Um, all of these agencies that have kind of a, a shared vision for working mainly um, in um, flood hazard mitigation um, have come together under the Silver Jacket Agency. So kind of the, the ideas that we put on this imaginary silver jacket and work together is, is one group, but leveraging the skills that, that each agency has for dealing with uh, basically flood related type hazards. And so uh, if you think back to the uh, 100 days of flooding on, on the Boise River, the silver jackets played a huge role in that, especially the resources that the Army Corps of Engineers was able to bring to the table to um, uh, help fight that flood. The flood inundation maps that you see on our webpage on the, on the National Weather Service Advanced Hydrologic um, Prediction Services portion of our webpage, that was a Silver Jackets uh, project as well. Um, engineers had it took um, infrastructure that uh, eight account emergency management. It was another example of a great partnership. I mean, in some ways, it kind of sounds like a weather radiation ambassador type project, but maybe that's kind of more along the hard science part of what Moji was talking about. If there's some hard science, but also some muscle involved, you know, when the Corps of Engineers comes and they can work a sandbagging project. This year, after the wildfires, this is truly a weather ready nation thing. Um, uh, some of the burn scars may be susceptible to debris flows. You know, debris flow is something that occurs when you have heavy rain on a burn scar and uh, a flash flood will come down and it's laden with all kinds of debris, rocks, mud, you know, pieces of trees, and it can be very, very, very destructive. So the Silver Jackets is looking to bring together resources from the different agencies to um, hopefully be a better service uh, to the community. Um, Tori, right. right, are you still on the call? Well, I thought I thought we might. There's one more question from the audience, and we only have five more minutes, so maybe maybe we'll move on to that one. Um, but hopefully we'll get back to that. I think it's just such a cool example of government agencies actually collaborating and working together on these on these issues. So I just wanted to give people a quick quick overview of what was going on. If we have time, we can um, we can pick Troy up. Um, Cade, do you want to? Un... Cade, Cade, do you want to ask your question? Perhaps, or I can go ahead and ask it. Yeah, my apologies. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm at work. I need to be visual. But uh, I was really curious what types of media, particularly in social media, that you might find most effective in order to disseminate London air disinfo. I love trying to get certain things out there to make our community more resilient. I was really curious uh, how has your success been with it? Is it hard to get our community to prefer? Did you catch? Okay, I think the sound was breaking up a little bit, but I think he's asking what um, forms of media are best reaching the public and and um, how, what's most effective. What's most effective? Yeah, Kate, I apologize. I couldn't quite hear you on, on my audio, but it sounds like the question was on what types of media best uh, reach the, uh, the public. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a great question. I don't know if I completely have have the answer. You know, I'm, I mentioned early on that the Weather Service, you know, issues forecasts, we issue watches, warnings, and advisories. 
and they kind of historically go out through our web page. That's sort of a media. They go out through a, a weather wire feed to our classic media. So you know, if you're just watching different uh, media channels on, on television, I think that's that's historically been a very effective way to get information out. So we have really good partnerships with all of our, our local media, all, all of the TV um, meteorologists. We try to uh, you know, develop a relationship uh, as well. And they're their own meteorologists as well, but you know, it's always an honor when, when they share our, our information and our watches, warnings, and advisories. In recent years, social media, so Facebook and Twitter, uh, has become a really important way that a lot of people receive weather information. And so we've tried to beef up our social media uh, program at NOAA National Weather Service. And yeah, I, I even see classic news media share some of our tweets and, and uh, Facebook posts um, on uh, TV. Uh, so I, I think that, um, that that's still going to remain an important way to, to share information, particularly preparedness information, you get a lot of traction with, with that, um, especially if it can direct you to a, a web page where you know there's kind of time to explore it a little bit more. But I think that a lot of people just like little bites of information in social media, you know, kind of serve that role. Um, and that was hard for the weather service to do. It was hard for a bunch of scientists to come up with pleasing looking graphics, but, you know, and, and so I, I'm, I'm just excited to kind of look at how far we've come as an agency, and particularly our office, Corey Anderson, one of our, our meteorologists, just has a great eye for graphics. John also has a good eye for, for graphics. So, you know, a lot of people coming out of the university now have those kinds of skills, you know, and, and it, it's really helping. I'm sorry if I couldn't quite hear the whole the whole uh, question, but that, that's my answer. <laughs> I think that I think that was that covered it. All right. Well, we have one minute left, so I just want to um, plug our next next speaker, which I just put a link in the chat. Um, so that will be next time on the social determinants of health, which will be really interesting. Jay, that was such a wonderful presentation and um, we've really enjoyed partnering with you. So thank you so much for, for that. Uh, I also just wanted to to say next week is the Idaho shakeout. It's actually national shakeout. So it's talking about earthquake preparedness um, and it's happening. It's like you, you do a little earthquake drill at 1015 on October 15th and we will be all for being here. And thank you again, Jay and John for partnering us with us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.